Okay, quick poll. Any of you ever go to an Elvis concert? Raise your hand. Anybody in here? All right, got a handful of folks. For those of you who may be of the younger generation, that guy's name is Elvis. <laughs> Hopefully you know. Help me out here. He is the king of? Come on, guy. He's the king of? It's okay to say rock and roll in church, by the way. It's really okay. I like rock and roll. I think Jesus likes rock and roll. Uh, it's the king of rock and roll. That's Elvis Presley. Each week we've been, we've been uh, starting with famous introductions of famous people, different kings in their own arena. And of course, what better one to end this series than the king of rock and roll, Elvis himself. Quite a fanfare. Every concert he began with that little fanfare. Uh, we're, what we're doing is we're ending our sermon series called Portraits, Four Pictures of Jesus, because each of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, introduced Jesus in a unique way, with a lot of fanfare, but uniquely as well. And so we're looking at each of them each week. We've already looked at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and today we look at John, who, who focuses above and beyond the others on the, the royalty, the majesty, and the kingship of Jesus. And so it's quite an appropriate introduction. Let me remind you of what we have done using this slide we looked at every week. Because going all the way back to the ancient church, the way that the different gospel writers have portrayed Jesus has been depicted by these four different symbols associated with each of the gospels. For Matthew, you see a winged man. For uh, Mark, you see a winged lion. For Luke, a winged ox or bull. And then today, focusing in on John, the Gospel of John, it's the winged eagle, of course. An eagle is quite appropriate. You see, John's image is an eagle to represent the exalted royalty of Jesus as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, because eagles are seen as majestic creatures, aren't they? Eagles are seen as exalted above all other birds of prey. They are the king in their arena. And, and this goes all the way back. This, this is not just our opinion, right? But it goes all the way back to the ancient times. In the ancient times, there were actually gods who were depicted as eagles. Going back to ancient Assyria, there are these, these relief uh, sort of etchings of the god Nimib or Nimurcha in ancient Assyria. We see these depictions on the ruins of pyramids and throughout the ancient world of eagles and two-headed eagles like that one. And they symbolize uh, divine strength. They symbolize the king and royalty of the birds themselves. But we don't have to go all the way back then to appreciate the power and the majesty of an eagle, do we? Because as Americans, that's kind of close to home. Uh, the bald eagle is our national emblem. This was decided back on June 20th, 1782, because even back then, despite Benjamin Franklin's desire that it, our national emblem be a turkey, um, <laughs> think about that. Uh, it was decided that it would be the eagle because of its symbolic strength. And because of its majesty and beauty, and because it was thought to only exist on our continent. And so what I want to do is talk about the eagle as a symbol, an analogy for Jesus the way John does. And starting with the strength of an eagle. Eagles are so strong, they're stronger than any other birds of prey. You see, they can even capture drones. Um, they actually can carry one-third of their body weight in the air. Their, their wingspans are so large, and their strength is so powerful. Uh, they can kill animals that are prey that are much larger than their own size. And it's a great way of understanding how John uses this image, the eagle, to depict Jesus. Because John attributes the strength of God, no less, to Jesus. Listen, you cannot read any of the Gospels, but especially the Gospel of John, and walk away with any other conclusion than that Jesus claims to be God. And that the author of that Gospel is attributing the strength of God to Jesus. And let me give you one example. There are, are several different sayings called the I am sayings. There are seven of them, and they're drawn out between several different chapters. 
And in each of these sayings, Jesus is very overtly claiming divinity and the very strength and power and identity of God. Let me just run through these real quick for you because they're really powerful and they all fit together and I'll explain to you how so. In John 6, it says, Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. In John 8, it says, When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. In John 11, it says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. You see, these are statements that no mere mortal could ever make. You can only be God and make these kinds of claims and promises about yourself and for others. In John 10, Jesus says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. Only God can offer salvation to others. Again in John 10, John 10, 14, he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. And then a famous one in John 14 that we have all heard so many times is Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Uh, None of us could ever say to someone, uh, I am the way and the truth and the life. You can't get to God except through me. And then John 15, the final one, he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, you take any one of these and they're amazing claims that no mere human mortal could make. But you take them all together and you have something that's like a package that's powerful and that's comprehensive. And in fact, in those days... Uh, the number seven was symbolic. There are seven different I am statements. And the number seven represented completeness or fulfillment. Think about the seven days of creation. God created in six days, and on the seventh day, he stepped back and said, it is good. I have done a good job. It's complete. I have fulfilled my design for creating this world. And so when we look at Jesus, these seven I am sayings are just by virtue, not only what they say, the content, but by virtue of the the number seven is itself a statement about who Jesus is as God the creator. All is complete. He is the fulfillment of God in the flesh. But there's even more than that. Because if you were one of his Jewish listeners in those days, and you heard him repeat again and again, no less than seven times, the statement, I am, I am, I am, your ears would perk up. It would grab your attention like a tacky billboard on Federal Highway. Because I am is nothing less than the name of God. It was given to Moses, you know, when he was sent to meet with God. And, and they said, you know, find out God's name. And, and he asked, and God gives him this really strange answer. I'll read it to you. This is out of Exodus chapter 3. God said to Moses, I am who I am. Sounds a little like a Dr. Seuss kind of thing, right? I am who I am. It's green eggs and ham. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. It's a very strange thing to say. And yet it's God's way of saying, you're not going to capture me even with a name. You're not going to limit me and box me in even with a name. I am. Uh, The actual Hebrew is, I am who I am. I will be who I will be. That's the literal way of understanding it. And here's Jesus. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. I am the gate. I am the way, the truth, and the life. It was no mistaking what he was saying about himself. To his original listeners. He is claiming the very strength of God as God. And that's good news because John, the Gospel of John, wants you and me to know that God has come in Jesus to apply his strength for you and not against you. Where did we ever get the idea that God is against us? I mean, in, in the world out there and even in the church, This idea that God is against us. God came in the flesh and funneled all the passion and power of heaven into Jesus for us. To rescue us, redeem us, restore us, and renew us. That is the continuous story of the scriptures. And that's where history is heading. 
Praise God. That's because of Jesus. And so you know what that means? This is, I want you to hear this. It means it's okay to not be okay. It means it's okay to be weak. It's okay to have doubts. It's okay to know that I'm sinful and I'm fallen because there's one who is strong on my behalf. And I lean on him. That's what a life of faith is. It's not about you being perfect. It's about drawing to the one who is. It's not about you being strong, but it's about attaching yourself to the one who is. The strength of Jesus, in other words, is sufficient for you. Don't rely on yourself. Rely on him. This is what John is leading us to. And it's this idea of the eagle's strength that leads us into thinking about Jesus and his strength. Well, we also know, you, you've certainly heard about the vision of eagles because they have incredible eyesight. They can see five to six times better than human beings. In fact, they can see a rabbit running on the ground three miles away from great height. Eagles actually have what, what are called monocular and binocular vision. That is, they can use one eye and the other eye separately or both together. Eagles can see straight ahead and to the side simultaneously. It's absolutely phenomenal, the eyesight that eagles have. And so it's a really interesting analogy, isn't it, as we think about how that applies to Jesus. Because as God, Jesus sees what we can't see. It, it, it's okay to not have all your questions answered. You know why? Because there's one who sees what you can't see. And, and so you're, you're to put trust in the one who sees better than you and I see. Listen to the way Jesus depicted this in John chapter 3, verse 12. He said, I've spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? You see, there's, there's just another realm that he's from and that he sees that we simply cannot see. And the beautiful promise for you and me that's attached to this is this. As God, Jesus opens our eyes to see rightly. You want to see life in yourself rightly? Look through his eyes. Look through his vision. Use his retina. Listen to what he said in John 10. This is the way John depicts this whole scenario. It says, The Jews who heard these words were again divided. Many of them said, He is demon-possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But others said, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? In Jesus' day, what's so very interesting throughout all the Gospels, he is curing blind people who were literally blind so that they could see while there were people who had vision but who could not see spiritually. They could not see what was right in front of them. They could not see God's grander purpose through the light of life that gives sight that being Jesus himself. It's an important thing for us to recognize that it's okay to have limited vision because we know one who sees what we cannot see. You ever watched birds hunt over the water? We see a lot of osprey out here, right? Uh, but eagles are no different as they hover over the water and they see the fish below the surface. And as you and I are watching, we can't see what's below the surface. But they do. And so they dive in and they catch the fish and they, they exit with their reward. And it's a surprise to us because we are never able to see what they can see. And that's what's so important to understand about Jesus. What John wants us to know. And listen, if you don't hear anything else in this sermon, hear this. This is what's important. The most important goal of your life is to see what Jesus sees. That's the most important thing you can do. Not to see through your own eyes. Not, not to see through the eyes of your parents. Not to see through, your, through the eyes of, of other authorities in your life, through political parties, through Facebook or media, but through Jesus. That's our goal. That's what it means to walk with Him and to see through His eyes because He has perfect vision. Well, we also can think about, and you're learning more about eagles than you ever wanted to know today, um, about the heights to which eagles fly, because they fly higher than most other birds. In fact, the golden eagle is known to fly to up to 15,000 feet. That is like where airplanes are. It's crazy high. They really get elevated. And we see how that's sort of depicted with Jesus through the gospel of John because he lifts up Jesus. He has an exalted Jesus that is unlike the other gospels. 
when you look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, as we have in the last three weeks, you see a very earthy Jesus. It begins with, in Matthew and Luke, a baby Jesus, right? He's in a manger, and there are all these angels and wise men, and, and there's a genealogy. He, he's, they are wanting to ground Jesus in his humanity, which is good. Mark starts with an earthy Jesus who starts as an adult with John the Baptist, but not John. John is altogether different. He begins with Jesus as this pre-existent God who existed before all time and space and matter, who was the author of creation, this God who is beyond all things, who's lifted up to heights that we can only imagine. He exists before all. Listen to the way John puts it in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. That's a claim to be God the Creator who existed before creation. And that is what's being attributed to Jesus, lifting Him up. I love the way Richard Burridge puts it when he compares the different Gospels as we have been doing. He says this, in the other Gospels, Jesus' story takes place on the horizontal dimensions of geography and history of Israel. John brings us into the vertical. Jesus is above and beyond all that. Did you hear that last line? Jesus is above and beyond all that. You know why that's important? Because you and I get caught up in all that, don't we? All that minutia of our daily lives all the drama of our family and friends and neighbors and work, right? We get caught up in this sort of limited sort of understanding and experience of life with others. We need a God who is beyond all that, above and beyond it, because you and I get stuck in a tiny little vision of our lives, We get stuck in a tiny little vision of life as we know it. And we operate from that place. And we limit ourselves. He alone, Jesus alone, can lift us up above all that. You see, you need Jesus' ability to lift you to new heights above your own inability. So many people struggle with self-doubt. Struggle with with insecurity and and self-loathing and poor self images. And Jesus says, you know what? I've come to lift you up above that. And that does not define you. I define you. I lift you beyond that. Your circumstances don't define you. I do. And there are other people that suffer from the other extreme. They're pretty self-satisfied, feeling pretty accomplished, feeling like, you know what? I've done good, and I'm pretty pretty independent-minded, and this is a good thing. And that can be just as much a problem as feeling like you are insecure about your inabilities. And so you and I need an exalted Jesus to lift us above what we think is good about ourselves to what he knows is best. Can I get an amen? You see, so often we think how we run our lives and what we think is best is actually only good. And we substitute what is good for what is best. That's what happens. We, or we, rather, we substitute what is best for what is good. And we don't even know it. I, I, I think about the story of a, a guy named Dickie Shoehorn. Now, anybody named Dickie Shoehorn, you know something funny is about to happen. Rob Bell tells a story about Dickie Shoehorn, who was a kid staying with his uncle. And uh, Uncle Vince, one day Dickie Shoehorn is enjoying breakfast and he says to his uncle, you know what, I love this cereal so much, I think I could swim in a pool full of it. And so being an uncle who wants to please his uh, nephew, he actually drained his pool and filled it with cereal and milk. Dickie Shoehorn went swimming in that pool full of cereal and milk. And he learned an important lesson that day. Something that starts out as a good idea is actually a gross idea because it doesn't take long, does it, for that cereal to get really soggy and that milk to get really dirty and really rancid. And isn't that a depiction of the way we live our lives? So often we think we know what's best 
And what we think is best is really just kind of a good idea that can backfire on us. And so we need someone who sees what's best and can lift us above what we think is best, beyond what's merely good. And Jesus alone, Jesus alone can lift you above your disappointments and into his greatness. Does anybody want that for their lives, for their family, for their children, for our community? This is what Jesus is coming to do for us. He didn't just die to give us fire insurance to avoid a fiery pit. He came to give us life to the full here and now with one another. And he will even lift you up in this way using the very storms of your life. He never wants to waste a pain. He wants to use whatever heartache and headache you have had or you do have. He uses the very storms of your life to lift you up. It's interesting because this whole analogy of an eagle depicts this as well. I learned this, I didn't know, uh, this week in researching this sermon, that eagles actually use the updraft of storms, because a lot of clouds have updraft, to go higher and higher even above the storm clouds. It provides relief for them. They don't have to flap their wings, and they can ride on the currents and on the updraft. It's an interesting sort of trivia about eagles, and it's such a great parallel for Jesus, isn't it? Because he not only enters into the storms of your life to lift you up, but he entered into the ultimate storm to be lifted up. What was the ultimate storm? It was being crucified on a cross. You can't get a much worse storm than that. So that he might then be resurrected to new life, lifted up to new life in order to share that with you and me. And listen to what He says in John chapter 12, he says, And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. In other words, this is not just about something that's good for Jesus, that he accomplished that. But he draws us into his new life, into the resurrected life. He lifts us up with him. That is his promise. Praise God. And here's what that means. Nothing can keep you down when you are lifted up by and with Jesus. Amen? Nothing can keep you down when you are lifted up by the only one who can soar to heights beyond our ability. And John wants you to know that. John wants you to know that in his gospel. John wants you to know that Jesus is the eagle who swoops from the highest of heights to enter into the depths of your darkness. And to rescue you. He he enters into your life wherever you are at a low point. Or even at a high point for you, which is actually a low point compared to him. And he enters into that to lift you higher with him. Eagles eagles, uh, are depicted in this way, not only in ancient times, but in in, in movies and in literature in uh, contemporary times, right? If you've ever read the Lord of the Rings trilogy or seen any of the movies of the Lord of the Rings, you will know that eagles play an important role in rescuing the key characters. In fact, Gwehir the, Lan- the Wind Lord, I was about to say Landlord, Gwehir the Wind Lord is the swiftest of the great eagles, and he descends as the divine rescuer who seeks and finds Gandalf the Great from his imprisonment in Isengard. If there are any Lord of the Rings fans, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. And it is Jesus who descends into whatever it is that imprisons us to free us. But here's the irony. He did so by himself entering into prison, didn't he? At the end of every gospel, we see this, where he is imprisoned. And it is through his entering into that condition that he frees all of us. Listen to the way it's depicted at the end of the Gospel of John. After being in prison, he's brought before Pilate to be interviewed. And this is what happens. It says, Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others tell you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate replied? Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it that you have done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. 
Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. And listen to this. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. That's our downfall. That's our downfall when we don't listen to the king of kings because he is the truth holder. That was Pilate's downfall too, wasn't it? Pilate did not understand that Jesus was the king from another world. Pilate did not understand that he was an eagle from infinite heights. Pilate did not understand the truth standing before him for one very simple reason. He didn't listen. He didn't listen. And so you have a king. You have a king with the strength of God. You and I have a king with the vision of eternity. You and I have a king who is above all of your limitations, all of your self-doubt as well as your self-confidence. You and I have a king who enters your storms. You and I have a king who lifts you up with him. And the only logical response of faith is to listen to him. The only logical response of faith is to bow before him, to submit to him as king of kings and lord of lords, recognizing his rightful majesty, recognizing his strengths, recognizing his limitless height, recognizing that he is the one who can lift us up with new life and to soar with him into new life. And listen, if you don't believe me yet, after preaching on Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John today, well, then I'm going to just have to bring in another pastor to finish it off. In fact, let me introduce you to S.M. Lockridge, a pastor of an African-American church in San Diego, California, who died around the turn of the century. And he's going to finish off this sermon. Let's exalt the King of Kings along with him. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's a sinner's savior. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He is the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. That's my king. He's indescribable. His life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't get him off of your hands. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Hey! Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. That's my king. That's my king.
charge to know that he is and he's more than capable that his strength is sufficient and that all you have to do is lean on him and that's what we're about here as a family of faith is pointing to the bread of life together is encouraging one another to live in the light of life together and letting the world see him make us come alive and inviting them to join us that's what it means to walk in faith as the people of God. Will you join me on that journey each and every step of the way? Listen, if, if today uh, maybe you have a hurt in your life, maybe, uh, maybe there's something going on, you'd like to talk about your faith or questions or doubts you have, struggles, or there is a pain going on in someone else's life, you'd like to lift up in prayer, whatever it is, we want you to know that we have a, a prayer opportunity for you immediately following the service. One of our Stephen ministers... Laura Zapataro will be located over here next to the piano. And Laura would love to greet you and pray with you and walk with you through whatever is going on. Don't hesitate to come forward and seek out some prayer time with Laura. Be sure, if you're a newcomer, to introduce yourself to, to Jan out there at our new Welcome Center. And uh, let's be sure we love on one another and on the world into which Jesus sends us because he sends us to be the body of Christ, not just here, but out there. Amen? Whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, remember to do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you and be gracious to you. And the light of the Lord's countenance shine upon your face and give you peace. Go now in peace in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever and all God's children said, 